Okay. Creationists, of course, would uh, dismiss evolution altogether because it contradicts the Genesis story of the creation of the world. But there are many Christians um, and other religious people who, who wouldn't do that, who would be perfectly happy to accept evolution as simply being God's way of bringing complex life about. Do you have any thoughts on that? Is that, is that a possibility? Well, I think it is important to make a distinction between uh, the young earth creationists, who are frankly loonies, just idiots, um, who actually think that the world is only 6,000 years old. I ask you, 6,000 years old, that's equivalent to believing that the width of North America from New York to San Francisco is 7.8 yards. So let's differentiate the idiots on the one hand from the serious Christians who think that the, the, the world really is old and agree that evolution is a fact, but who think that evolution is God's way of doing things. Well, that's not totally stupid. I mean, um, if you were an extremely lazy God, that's the way you'd do it, because you wouldn't have to actually have to do anything at all. Um, all you would have to do would be to start the universe going and then sit back and watch it all happen. And a fascinating spectator sport, indeed, it would be. Um, but I must say, as I said before, it, it is a rather um, strange way of going about things. You, you might think that if God were really wanting to make it pretty convincing that he exists, he, would, he wouldn't choose as a way of bringing us into existence the one way which makes it look as though he's not there. So um, it, it, it is a way out, and it's a way out that is adopted by all serious theologians, I mean by bishops and and archbishops and popes and things. I forgot the Pope's the Antichrist, isn't he? I forgot about that. Um, but it's the, it's the way that's adopted by all uh, serious theologians. But as I say, I think it rings pretty hollow. Are there any sort of forms in evolution that would actually seriously argue against that? And I'm thinking in terms of, uh, I mean, nature can be very cruel. Um, and, and we seem to be full of design flaws if, if we were designed at all. Would, would you like to say a word or two about that? There are two points there. But what, one is the cruelty which you've just mentioned. Um, when you look at the elegance of the apparent design of, say, a, a cheetah or a lion and the antelopes that they're, that they're hunting, if God has designed both of those, then God has designed the, the lion to be an extremely good antelope killer and at the same time God has designed the antelopes to be extremely good lion escaper and you sort of wonder well whose side is God on um, you know why doesn't he make one side or the other win nature is very very cruel it's exactly what you would expect if there were no God you would expect nature to be cruel because you would expect that antelopes and lions cats and mice dogs and rabbits would be the end products of a long evolutionary arms race in which each one in evolutionary time is pressing the other one just like the arms race between the Russians and the Americans each advance on the predator side is countered by an advance on the prey side so that uh, in the end product of the arms race is that both the lions and the antelopes are very very good at what they do the lions are extremely good at chasing antelopes the antelopes are extremely good at escaping from lions, the result is extreme cruelty, extreme pain, extreme fear. And it's precisely what you'd expect if it had come about through evolution by natural selection. And the other point you made was the about... Um, design flaws. About uh, design faults. Yes. I was talking about the eye a bit earlier. If you look at the human eye, the retina is backwards. You can think of the, of the retina as being a bank of photocells which are gathering light and there are millions and millions of them and each one is reporting on the state of light um, at the surface of the retina where it is back to the brain. So if you were a designer making a bank of photocells, you would have all the photocells pointing as my fingers are towards the light. But in fact in the human eye they're pointing backwards. They're pointing away from the light. The light has to pass through the connecting wires that are connecting the photocell, the backwards pointing photocells. And the, and the wires, that's the, that's the nerve cells, run over the surface of the retina, getting in the way of the light, 
and then finally they come to the blind spot where they dive through the retina because it's back to front and then they go back to the brain. Now, no designer would do that. It's a bonkers way to design things. <laughs> but it is what you would expect as a result of historical accident. That's the way the eye just happened to arise originally, hundreds of millions of years ago, probably thousands of millions of years ago. And as a consequence of that historical accident, that's the way it still is. Because even if it might make a certain amount of sense for natural selection to reverse the retina, think of the upheaval that that would involve in the embryological processes. Evolution, unlike a human designer, or presumably a god designer, cannot just go back to the drawing board, cannot throw away the existing design, toss it away, get a clean sheet of paper on the drawing board and start afresh. Evolution has to start with what it's got and modify what it's got so that we are rife with historical accidents. They're all over the body. That's one of the reasons why humans suffer so much back pain, uh, because we are so recently risen from walking on all fours, and we haven't yet properly accommodated to walking on our hind legs. We are walking museums of historical accidents. And of course we're also human, which makes it terribly tempting for us to think that somehow we are the end product of evolution and always intended to be the end product of evolution. Rather than ask you to speak on that, I've got a very brief reading there for you, <coughs> just, just a paragraph which I think tackles that issue very nicely. This is from the opening chapter of my book, The Ancestor's Tale. It's called The Conceit of Hindsight. It is a conceit of hindsight to see evolution as aimed towards some particular end point, such as ourselves. A historically minded Swift, understandably proud of flight as self-evidently the premier accomplishment of life, might regard Swift kind, those spectacular flying machines with their swept back wings who stay aloft for a year at a time and even copulate in free flight, as the acme of evolutionary progress. If elephants could write history, they might portray tapirs, elephant shrews, elephant seals, and proboscis monkeys as tentative beginners along the main trunk road of evolution, taking the first fumbling steps, but each for some reason never quite making it, so near yet so far. Elephant, elephant astronomers might wonder whether on some other world there exist alien life forms that have crossed the nasal Rubicon and taken the final leap to full probositude. <laughs> Thank you. Bob Cormack mentioned uh, your book, The Selfish Gene, which I think was, was the book that launched you on the international scene and, and made you well known as a science writer. It's a book that's created a certain amount of confusion in people's minds, I think, just, just because of the title, um, as if you were advocating selfishness and justifying it on the basis of our genes. Would you like to just take a moment and explain what that book does argue? But yes, just I, I, wrote, I wrote The Selfish Gene in 1975, and at that time there was a spate of popular books by people like Robert Ardrey and Conrad Lawrence, uh, which advocated what's been called group selection, the idea that natural selection chooses between large groupings of animals, even species. And you can see the appeal of this because it means that you can easily account for animals being altruistic towards each other. If animals are selfish, then the group to which they belong might go extinct. And so group selection might um, favor individual altruism. Now that's not how natural selection works. I wanted to explain how natural selection works. And the right way to explain it, as I thought and still think, is the level of the selfish gene. Natural selection actually doesn't favor the differential survival of different groups. What it favors is the differential survival of genes. Those genes that are good at surviving are the ones that do survive, and all animals are built by genes that have been successful in programming the survival of their ancestors. And one way to put that is to say 
that not a single one of your ancestors ever died young. Lots and lots and lots of your ancestors' contemporaries died young, but not one single one of your ancestors died in childhood. Not a single one of your ancestors ever failed to copulate at least once.